ten dollar horse and a forty dollar saddle. Going into punching in Longhorn cattle. Come a tie, I yippee yippee I yippee yay. I'm a tie, I yippee yippee yay. I started up the trail October 23rd. Started up the trail with the two you heard. Come a tie, I yippee yippee I yippee yay. I'm a tie, I yippee yippee yay. Tell them, Don. Woke up one morning on the Chisholm Trail with a rope in my hand and a cow by the tail. Come a tie, I yippee yippee I yippee yay. Come a tie, I yippee yippee yay. Now you read. Tell them up in the morning before daylight, before I sleep, the moon shine bright. Come a tie, I yippee yippee I yippee yay. Come a tie, I yippee yippee yay. Well, I want to welcome everybody once again to the uh, Ellensburg Rodeo Hall of Fame Museum. We are incredibly proud of this museum. I know we've got, this is a handful of years now that we've had it open, and I'm continually just, maybe surprised is not the right word, but I'm always just impressed with what we have on display. And um, the speaker series, in my opinion, adds to that. So for those who don't know me, uh, my name is John Goodat. I'm a proud member of the Hall of Fame board with our president, Kent Lester, there attending bar and his better half as well. Um, so the speaker series uh, continues into this year. Um, anybody who's here heard me speak, uh, pardon me for being a, sounding like a broken record, but it was just such a success last year for the centennial. It was so obvious that we wanted to continue with it um, from a, on a quarterly basis uh, in 2024 as we start the next round of 100 years for the Ellensburg Rodeo. And, um, you know, there's some familiar faces from uh, the fashion show that we did a few months ago. Obviously, tonight is Posse Night. Um, and then in a couple of months, we're going to have uh, judges. I believe it's in mid-October is when, or late October is when we're going to talk about the judging and the, the history of scores and times in, in the Ellensburg Rodeo arena as well. And so before we get to our special guests of the evening. Uh, I just want to remind everybody here at the Hall of Fame, um, if you're members, thank you very much. If you, uh, this is just a reminder to renew membership as we do on an annual basis, or if you're interested in being a member of the Hall of Fame in terms of being a member in terms of an annual membership or in terms of being a, you know, a committee member or volunteer, you can see us here in our in our blue shirts or in our uh, polos with our logos on them. If you have any questions about how you can interact with the Hall of Fame, please ask us tonight or, or any time. Um, speaking of the Hall of Fame, the banquet, you can see our inductee wall here of uh, Charles Pogue and, and Dave Brock and, and the Eaton family. We're very excited and really looking forward to the banquet here that's on the 24th of uh, August, that's five o'clock. It's gonna be at the Spirit Therapeutic Writing Center uh, in on, Sor on Sorensen Road, there in between Ellensburg and Kittitas. And I talk with all the inductees off and on a couple of times a month and um, every year we're excited for it, but this year um, these inductees are very excited. I look forward to some of the artifacts that they're gonna bring and donate to the, to the Hall of Fame. They're looking forward to you know, just talking about some stories, um, some, you know, witty anecdotes, probably some funny stories as well. Dave Brock was talking about some uh, interesting tidbits of wild cow milking championships. He was talking more about that than, than the all-around buckle that he won in 1973. So, um, and those who are with us on the pint night the other night, pint night, pint afternoon there at Whipsaw last Saturday, a huge success. Um, so if you were there, thank you very much for having a beer or two or three. Um, the Hall of Fame really benefited from it. Charlie um, and Deb there, the owners of, of Whipsaw, they're huge supporters of the community. Charlie and I are in the top hands together, so he's very rodeo oriented as well. So uh, a round of applause to Whipsaw and a round of applause to everybody who helped us out. And then really quick, I just want to remind you, if, if you missed Whipsaw, but uh, uh, or the pint night, we have our whiskey night, which was very well received the last couple of years that we've done that. That's gonna be in um, October as well, so look for some publicity on that in terms of signage or Facebook postings or other social media. And then of course tonight we have our quilt raffle, we're selling our wine as well, and if you have membership questions, we can answer those for you as well. But we're done with hearing me talk. 
Uh, tonight is Posse Night, and we have members from the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse and our King County Posses as well. We're going to introduce our first uh, speaker tonight, Oscar Berger, who needs no introduction. Come on down here if you could, Oscar. So I have a few things that, you know, that we can talk about on the script, but this man needs no introduction. He will, um, he has traveled to so many rodeos. He has been an incredible representative to rodeo in general, in general, but the Ellensburg Rodeo, the Posse, all of the countless nameless, uh, maybe faceless volunteers that are in the arena. He's been a huge promoter of keeping the Western lifestyle going, the rodeo lifestyle going. It's just been, um, I mean, you are, you sir, are such an asset to uh, Ellensburg and the Kittitas Valley and the Western way of life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Oscar Berger. Well, first off, uh, thank you for coming. I'm very nervous about doing this. This has been a lot of work putting this together for tonight. I'm going to be reading most of this stuff because I've been putting it on the computer and out of these books over here on this showcase. You might want to look through those. There's a lot of uh, posse information that goes clear back. However, um, I do want to let you know, oh, first off, this shirt. This shirt was made by Wanda Harmon, Wanda Bacon, Donnie Bacon's sister. This was made in 1961 for John Sprouse, who became the captain in 67, 68. But she monogrammed all the tails of every shirt. And I got two from Low Driver, from Joe McManamy, uh, Jay Sprouse. Uh, it's just numerous. There's probably got to be a seven or eight shirts total uh, that uh, we're holding. And they will eventually come to the Hall of Fame here, too. But anyway, I did want you to know the hat. I got the hat from Ed McDowell, and he said this came somewhere into play in after the 50s and 60s. So I don't know. I thought, well, tonight's the night to wear it. So with that, uh, uh, John, I was going to take and mention to you, uh, most of these people I had the opportunity of uh, being a trick writer here and being able to perform here in 71, 72, and 72 along with my wife and uh, as the Flying Cossacks. A book just came out this last week and there's an article on it in the back seat there. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. John. Oh, you got it there. Yeah, okay. This was a promotional thing through uh, Ranch and Home. All I knew is I, I did a photo shoot for it uh, I gave them the information. I had no idea it was supposed to come out in the, for the 100th year, and they just got to it now. So anyway, if you did get a chance to see it, uh, I thought they did a good job on it. Really quick, uh, I'll, I'll pass this around, um, or I'll, I'll have it on, on one of the tables here. It was really quite an article, and y I know you're already downplaying it, Oscar, but... Um, they got your good side on all the photo shoots. <laughs> you looked incredible. You looked very athletic still. Um, but it really talks about his history as, um, as a trick writer, but how he incorporated his, his family. Um, and it was just, it was, still is to a certain degree. I'm sure you could do some tricks still, Oscar. Well, I think I could, uh, uh, the circumstances <laughs> yeah. But it was a really interesting article. So you, you downplayed it in your, in your normal candor, but uh, I'll make sure that it's uh, on one of the glass cases here for, for us to thumb through. With that, I'm going to get started. First off, the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse was formed in the late 1939, 40, and 41. Members and founders was Dr. John Richardson, who was a local veterinarian and also a member of the Ellensburg Rodeo Board at the time. Dr. Carl Ostrander, he was a local medical doctor, and Dr. Robert McConnell, who was an educator uh, doctorate. He had a doctorate. In. He was also the president of the Washington State Normal School, which was the precursor now to Central Washington University. All three of these men were currently serving on the Ellensburg Rodeo Board at the time. The doctors had made many trips to California 
for clinics and conventions down there. And they had the opportunity of meeting up with the San Francisco Mounted Sheriff's Posse. Of course, most of you know they're the Golden Palominos with the Silver Saddles. And they thought, God, this is something that we could take back to Ellensburg and we could make into it, but we don't want silver and the horses because they were dealing with businessmen, ranchers, and uh, volunteers who, who they could get. Anyway, King County was able to pull this off, and they did a beautiful job, and you'll hear this later tonight. But anyway, they thought that this would fit into it, so in their travels, they also had a chance of viewing the uh, Oregon and Salem, the governor's brigade there, and that was quite an outfit too, so they kept gleaning information from the two groups to put together what they thought would be the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse. Anyway, when they got back here, they had several back meetings out back and at various ranches and everything, and they went through uh, Clifford Kaner. He was the current editor of the Yakima, uh, the Yakima, excuse the Evening Record, and so he jumped on board to help them with it. He was not a member of the rodeo board at that time, but he was going to help with the major promotion and getting the word out for the surrounding community that we need, they needed members. That was very long. There was a very little going on in the actual year of 39 because this was late in the year. And I think Dr. Richardson went back to the, um, what is the big parade on the 1st of January? Rose Bowl, because they were going to be riding in the Rose Bowl. So he went back there and picked up more information. So then he came back here and uh, had various meetings with the local ranchers, businessmen, and horse enthusiasts. They were busy talking and taking in potential members at the same time. And in the summer of 1940, things really started shaping up. They acquired, uh, trying to figure out what, how they were going to put this together, they acquired the uh, talents of a former cavalry drill master by the name of Dave Adams. And Dave Adams uh, said that he wanted to also join in with the posse besides he was going to be their drill master to put this together. So he started right away with the training and managing of putting the drills together. And he was, uh, along with his assistant, Herman Turner. And I think several of you here probably knew Herman Turner himself. but. Uh, and, I, and I had a chance to meet him at one time. They signed up a lot of the large cattle ranches, businesses, and professional men. A lot of these ranches was also providing the stock to the Ellensburg Rodeo, and they also were very uh, helpful in the actual building of the, uh, uh, the arena and the rodeo grounds. The, men at the, time, uh, the men at this time, excuse me, so, uh, were allowed to ride any color of horse that they might own or then drill master. Dave Adams would put together four or five different drills of different lengths of time. He was also the professional at this, and with his cavalry experience, he was able to form the drills with columns of matching colored horses throughout as they practiced in 40 and 41. He had pentos, blacks, whites and grays in one column, bays and sorrows. You must remember the war broke out in December 7th, 1940, which was carrying over into the year of 1941. When 1941 came about, they had a total of 26 uh, members, active members in the posse, for them to make their appearance. Uh, they had also decided to use a drill of 14 minutes in length for their official hallmark presentation at the 1941 rodeo and performances at the night show, which we now still refer to as the posse night shows. These riders were all carrying guns. They were holstered and deputized. There was absolutely no music to their drills at all and all that could be heard was the sharp military commands being called out by the drill master. It has been reported that literally hundreds and, and hundreds of people, and this came from Bob Neely and John Lutka's book, uh, The Tradition Lives On, uh, 
literally hundreds of people that had been watching the group as they practiced every Thursday, Friday, or Sunday evenings from April through September with from their cars atop the famous Craigs Hill parking lot and the newly constructed 5,000 seat East Hillside grandstand. And uh, the posse guys, I think you guys realize the area there, uh, right behind the Gold Buckle building, that they helped build 5,000 seat grandstands at that time. Uh, and the posse helped with that. But anyway, back to this, the men were all decked out in their custom made uniforms and their uniforms was made by nudies of Hollywood, clothiers to the stars, and V. Turk Brothers of Van Nuys, California. The uniform of the day was of a khaki gabardine pant, matching shirts with off-colored green trimmings and yokes, and waist-length cut bolero jackets, which they could see their buckles underneath them, with white neck scarves and brown derby-styled hats. Besides the original 26 members in 1941 and 42, by 42, 43, and through 44, their membership grew an additional 32 more members, making the posse 58 members strong. At this time, several of the rodeo board members that were wearing basically two hats, because they were also rodeo board members and posse members, they be started becoming less active in the posse portion of it, and they just put their concentrations in on the rodeo production itself. As war broke out in December and changes were starting to take place, the rodeo board at that time was having problems with the professional rodeo under the Turtle Association, and they were trying to get things kind of finalized right during that time. Finally, at the request of the president, of, oh, excuse me, for 1940. Finally, at the request of the president of the United States and the Washington State governor in 42, 43, 44, which was declared the war years, the rodeo itself had to be canceled due to no large state gatherings were being allowed, and of course, gas rationing was likely, was in effect by presidential demand. The rodeo board and the posse did get an official clearance from the governor's office if we could hold a community event, including the Kittitas County Fair, so that we could save the, our date uh, and our time for the Ellensburg Rodeo. With that, the board and the posse asked the posse wives who had formed a very large uh, opening. They had a, a group of ladies, uh, posse wives, of 28 strong and they had formed their own posse group. I do have their book at home that takes me through 1959. I'm gleaning stuff out of that. So uh, with that, sa with that said, uh, let me see. Okay, the auxiliary who had formed their own posse group and gathering of wives, if they would take over putting together an afternoon evening event for community entertainment and during the war years. With that said, they brought in the military men, their jeeps from Moses Lake, Ephrata, and the military brigade that was housed at Bowers Field here in Ellensburg, if they would offer jeep rides up and down the Craig's Hill, which is the Indian Trail, and all of the monies would be donated back to the military for their USO, USO and furniture for the YMCA, which contained a military lounge to handle the men, the brigade out at uh, Bowers Field. I think it was Bob Neely that reported that in the three days, these women, rodeo board members, and posse members in 42, 43, and 44, over those three years, sold over $40,000 worth of war bonds and stamps, and that money going back to the USO included in their entertainment plan that these ladies put together. It was a very large horse show prior to the year of 42. Community leaders pr had produced a large Indian pageant here in the arena, which required some 200 to 250 local individual actors and players. This took place from 1928 through 1939 years and was called the Blazers of the Trail. The pageant was written by H.C. Fish with the help of Floyd Rossman and was directed by Miss Nellie Burke, who was a teacher at Central Washington University 
and I did get a chance to meet her, and um, that she and she told me that she had helped work on this uh, through the state normal school. The pageant alone required several months of evening practices a week because the pageant was performed in four acts, and the various acts participated at different days of the week and for different times of the day. There was a total of 100 Indians needed to pull this off, and the Yakima Nation did not have that many that they could bring in for this. And so with that, uh, in part, they went to their chiefs and their sub-chiefs. Their chief was the announcer for the rodeo the one year, and I, I don't know what that was, but I know it was the chief, for some reason, did the announcing. But anyway, several of the sub-chiefs then went to the tribal members of the Confederated Tribe from the Colville Nation, which many of them are also related in, uh, yeah. The actual uh, original performance took several hours to put this on. However, with these women taking it on, they could only do part of the original production that they added to their horse show, as well as the Jeep rides up and down the uh, cliff. A copy of the program is available in one of my books over here. Most of my information regarding the Blazers of the Trail production has come from a very dear friend of mine that I had the opportunity when I went to work for the school district. Uh, she was a teacher at Hebler Elementary, and her name was Barbara Kohler, and she also interviewed at that time for my posse presentation that I did in, 19, uh, in 2001 at the Kittitas County Museum, along with my dear friend, Mary McManamy Sr., Rex Rice, Everett Gordon, and, and Dr. Carl Ostrander. She, at the time I interviewed her, she was a current teacher at Hebler. Barbara not only played a part in the performance, but assisted as an actor in portion of this pageant for the War Years production, and helped kind of keep things in order there so that they kept somewhat of the program exactly the same. This carried over, and when the Posse Wives took over for the War Years performance, it became a very large local horse show with the Jeep rides. And this was the startup of what we now refer to as the Posse Night Shows. Not only was the Posse involved with the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night shows, but we also conducted Pony Express relay races, cliff races, war bonnet races, and the chuck wagon races on the track throughout the entire rodeo performances. The Posse's performance was a major highlight and accomplishment for the rodeo board and was, we became known as the ambassadors on horseback as we accompanied the current year's rodeo royal court for all their travels and parades throughout the state and at all local and social events. In the early years, the Posse belonged to the State Posse Association and participated in the state at various, in various communities with their representative groups in division horse shows and competition. Then once a year, the entire state would get together for a state meet in Yakima, Omak, Walla Walla, and Ellensburg. Uh, I, we got to do that one time when I first came in uh, here in Ellensburg. We had the room, we had the track to do it. But in 1941, we made our debut uh, here at the Ellensburg Rodeo, and this really went over big, big, big time. And that's why that following year they took on those 32 additional members because there was so much enthusiasm and, and they realized that they had hit the nail on the head for an advertising tool for the Ellensburg Rodeo. In 1947, the posse was invited to attend. This was their first outing. They, after being formed in 1941, in 1947 was their first leaving town as a posse. The posse was invited to attend the Roslyn Coal Festival and parade in beautiful downtown Roslyn and were also invited to ride at the Seattle Seafair Parade for their first time, riding through the large outdoor coliseum of the University of Washington. 
this is the flag they carried in 1947. Um, and this flag was used until 1969, at which time then they went to this one over here. Uh, on January 10th, 1944, six members and trustees of the posse made an application to Bell Reeves, who was the Washington State Secretary of State, to certify and recognize the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse as a mounted equine group, known uh, the certificate that they issued, and it's also in that far book. It was the Remington status for the state of Washington. This was completed and recognized on J July 11th of 1944 when 24 of the original 26 members of the posse and the rodeo board by invitation traveled to Olympia and the original members present signed off on the certificate uh, certification at a large reception at the t Capitol Dome, which there is a copy of that document also in the very first part of that book. This made the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse the first such recognized equine group in the entire state and along with the Oregon Governor's Brigade, they were the largest two mounted groups in the entire Pacific Northwest. King County, as you're gonna hear shortly, uh, the King County Mounted Posse followed suit several months later, making it three of the largest groups in the entire Northwest. It was decided in 43 that the membership and according to the group's newly adopted bylaws and what their application certification was to the state, they would not have more than 100 total members according to when their bylaws were originally drawn up. Then in the years of 45 through 48, they took on another 16 members, making the membership to 75 total members, which is the largest, the largest that the posse has ever been. The group proved to be a very popular addition to the Ellensburg Rodeo from its start, and the members, and then after that, they started losing through attrition, some burned out, some was concentrating more on the rodeo board, its production and everything, deaths and the such. In 1947, here now we go a little ways away from this, but this may not interest you guys that much. But in 1947, the posse made an inquiry and an application to our Kittitas County Commissioners for one of the no longer used military buildings at the corner of Bowers Field and Airport Road, which was no longer being used for military usage. It was a rather large building complete with the original military stoves, restrooms, and a very large dining hall. There was also four acres out back that the posse membership built fencing around to help handle visiting groups that were here for posse competitions or for here for the rodeo it itself that would hold the horses. They also rented the shooting range, which was down the road, and I think George was at the Cascade Shooting Club, yeah, which was down the street a couple blocks for any additional space that they would need so we would have a place to house the visiting people. This building was used as a clubhouse for the posse where meetings, dances, and gaming nights could be held. Lots of gaming nights, I'll tell you. A large, long-term lease was made by the posse, and they used this extensively, held dances every year on Saturday night of the big rodeo weekend, besides posse-sponsored oyster feeds and gaming nights. We formed a clubhouse committee and started renting the building out for weddings. That got a little touchy with uh, alcohol being an issue, uh, and large meetings and the such. The Posse Clubhouse Committee maintained a five-year lease on this building at Bowersfield, and finally, after three years shy of leasing this building for 50 years, we received word from the Port Commission, which Maury Dufault was working with and helped keep our lease going. They wanted to, felt the land was needed, for other things and it was in their plans to be torn down. Our captain at that time, Dr. Sam Rust, Ed McDowell, my wife and I, we removed everything from the posse house that I could take because they, they gave it to me. They were gonna wreck it. 
So this is all owned by me that's going to be owned by you guys. Uh, anyway, this is the sign. Many of you went to the dances there. You saw that sign on the front of this deal. And inside there was a, a rail fence with two wagon wheels. I have that in my garage and storage unit. Uh, anyway, I, I thought this was unique because um, it, it was really a lot of fun getting this stuff out of there in time for the trucks to keep from wrecking at all. I also, and Mary McManamy Jr., I call her, Mary Subert, anyway, all around the inside of the dance hall of that was lined with a seven and a half inch board, 16 feet long. It was all decorative trim. I've got all of this in my barn. There's 10 boards in a series, and the, they are all specifically cut by in Cleellum. They were branded with all the brands of the current posse and rodeo board members brands of that day. And I'm hoping that somewhere we can figure out a place that they uh, they need to go. They need to be, yeah, yeah. That. But anyway, after their removal, the building became history, and many of the ranchers and, and their families had all kinds of things to say because of the life that they had and all of the fine, fine fun. And it was fun, I'll tell you. I worked many a night on putting on the dance out there, and let me tell you, I saw a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't know if there was any kids there, but I think there was a lot of virginity lost there at that there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is recorded. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Take back. <laughs> yeah. In January of 1946, the county commissioners received a letter from the Posse's Board of Trustees. Of our intent, we were going to buy the land at the base of Craig's Hill for the building of posse barns to assist in housing visiting posses and horse groups. Um, they asked the commissioners to view the land before we made our decision on the land and they gave them to the 28th. Howard Barnes represented the posse and made the final presentation to the county commissioners asking for help to grade and level all that property for the building of the posse barn, the two posse barns. On June 17th of 1946, Barnes reported back to the commissioners that all the materials were on hand at the base of the Craig's Hill to build the two barns, and but we could use some additional grading uh, as soon as possible because we wanted to get going on this. They told him that would be done next week. So with that, Howard reported that he also had been approached by the owners of the remaining raker property, and I, that doesn't ring bell with me, but I, I wrote it, but that is the family, that the remaining raker property, which adjoined the posse barn, which adjoined the posse barn, this land was available to purchase for $5,000. The posse didn't have it uh, at that time, and in conversation and in meetings with the county commissioners, they felt that let's refer this back to the fair board because the fair board had intentions of enlarging and increasing, and so they had their tabs on a couple of homes there, but they, uh, they ended up buying the land to add into the enlargement of the Kittitas County Fairgrounds, which now is the event center. Anyway, on July 4th, 1950, it was reported there was a spectacular 4th of July fire which totally destroyed both of the posse barns. The posse, through our insurance at that time, there was enough monies to buy and pay for all the materials that was needed to rebuild, but we, des we definitely were desperate and we, need, we needed help with the construction of the barns as rodeo was in less than two months away. And uh, Bob Neely wrote quite a uh, article in the paper about that, and I got that in, in one of the books too, but where it was just two weeks away. So in a last ditch effort, 
the county commissioners ask all the carpenters unions, construction and electrical engineers unions, uh, unions for their assistance with this major event to help us get this rebuilt because it was very vital. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to basically have the rodeo without these barns. These three unions, as well as the local volunteers, gave all of their free time on weekdays, nights, plus weekends to rebuild these barns, and the job they completed on August 27th of 1950, two weeks in front of the arrival of the visiting groups for the Ellensburg Rodeo. I thought this was unique because we wondered all along on our barns, you know, when they came about, where they were, and all that. So this kind of seals it for us. In 1947, the posse made its first out-of-town travels to a parade, first to the upper county for the coal mine. Then they were invited to Seattle. In 1951, the posse members voted into bylaws that all members will have to ride sorrel horses from now on and no longer would be riding all colored horses. And I will tell you that it was kind of cruel what they did. But anyway, the horses could not have long tails. They had to be cut off at the hock. Yeah, and they had to be roached. Uh, anyway, we were allowed to ride all, no longer could we ride uh, colored horses. In the early 70s, the posse acquired the help of Rodney Hussey who was a semi-truck owner and driver to deliver the posse and the royal court's horses to the Spokane, Olympia, and the Seafair parades. The posse would haul a loading and unloading ramp to take the horses off and onto the semi at these locations. Always one of the posse members would ride shotgun with Rod aboard the semi driver in case of any unforeseen troubles with the horses. He did demand that all the horses be muzzled to stop all the biting and fussing while being transported. And because he was tired of us, uh, not us guys, but it, it came into play with us also. The horses were end up biting each other and we had horses lamed up and everything when we get to a parade. So anyway, he decided that to do muzzled and then he'd do them head to tail and they would always have to be parked back to the same horse that they rode over with to come back and there'd be 30 of us on the semi along with the queen and the court. Um, this was done for 20 years until Rod no longer, uh, you know, I'll lose you probably here in a little bit of this, I'm kind of going for a way, but this was done for some 20 years before Rod no longer wanted to drive the semi as his eyes was really getting bad and he had demacular generation. King and Ellensburg Posse has always been very close, and that is why we are both here on this evening's program. I must add, as a special note, that my family, my family and King County Posse have always been very close, and it was always a dream of mine on a bucket list. I remember Lucille Croshaw and uh, Bert and Ernie, <laughs> Bert and Ernie, yes. Uh, one of their uh, nephews was one of our principals. And so anyway, I, I always talked to her and I remember she was such a sweetheart. I remember I was getting ready to go out and trick ride. And uh, I had that tight, tight outfit on, you know, and hell, you don't have any pockets to stick anything in there. And of course the kids wanted something to drink. And so anyway, she said, I'll take care of them. You just go out and perform, okay? So anyway, she was very helpful, and I, she was just a saint. You know, I just loved her to death. But anyway, uh, long story short, they were very special to me, and I told her someday I wanted to ride with the King County Posse. Anyway, Bill just shared with me, uh, Bill and Scott and Chuck and Lon saw to it that in... 2014 bill uh, they honored my request and made me a one day member of the King County Posse <laughs> and I got to set pivots in number two yeah and Scott said I cried all the time <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so they years back they this family has been very special and now I'm very lucky to have next door my next door neighbor is Scott Brown with his family that's here. 
and this is very special. They really made this dream a reality, and I was very honored to get to do this. Okay, now I'm going to go to the posse history. I know you guys are probably tired of this, but anyway, the history portion from us joining the posse, we did the Wenatchee Apple Blossom Festival was and has always reminded, remained a drive to Wenatchee parade, stop at a restaurant, always at a reserved restaurant in Wenatchee or Kashmir so that we could stop if there was available and watch the running of the Kentucky Derby, have lunch with our families and come back to Ellensburg. Spokane uh, Lilac Festival. This parade was quite a lot of traveling back and forth as I can remember going in in 70, 76. As we not only had to take our horses into the rodeo grounds, load the horses into the semi for transport, load up the portable ramps that had to carry to all the parades for the semi in order to get the horses back unloaded. We then went back home, picked up our wives, kids, drove to Spokane to a motel, usually out on division someplace, somewhere near the parade route, and we had to wait for the semi. The semi would pull into the area of Spokane down on the river uh, near the train tracks, which those are not here now, guys. Now it's a beautiful skating park down there. It's just beautiful. But anyway, it was, oh my God, this was a mess. I'll tell you was all covered in pieces of coal and the damn coal dust was everywhere. We really had fun with yellow shirts, tack, white saddle pads and silver belly hats. I said, yuck. Then we would pull the truck with the portable ramp up to the semi and unload all the horses. Many times we had 18 to 20 riders at least. Then the clean, then the cleanup would start between horse manure and coal dust on horses with white socks wasn't a good combination for parades and being judged for cleanliness. <laughs> the good, oh, we had so much coal dust on our hats. Uh, George can acclaim to that. It's just, mm. but anyway, the good part of it, we parked right where the semi was at the staging area and started the parade. Judging was done in the parade route or in the lot there. And then we rode the parade and came right back to the staging area so we could load right back up with our horses. After riding the very well-organized parade route, and it's always been a very well-organized parade route, we would back up the semi untack or reload back to the motel where we had a special room for a potluck and socializing. At that given time, with lots of planning, we did group up. There was probably around 10 of us, I would say, uh, posse couples. George and Barb was there, Joe and Molly Morrill, my wife and I. Many of us, we'd group up and we'd head out to the dances. We'd go to the Elks, Eagles, or the Moose Lodge, wherever we could find somebody to take and check us in and clear us to get in. But we would go there for several hours of dancing. and. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, next, we, next parade after Cleelum was Easton Memorial Day Parade and the Moses Lake Spring Fling Parade. Many times only us posse members drove to Easton for this parade, either paired up or drove ourselves. The parade is only a two and a half block long parade, but it's very well attended especially in this day today, because they felt they had some three to 5,000 uh, spectators this year. Uh, and we did this uh, for probably 10 or 12 years. Uh, it has really picked up up there in that area, and they br they're bringing in some rather large uh, drum and bugle, uh, various teams. You know, but there was very few uh, mounted posse groups uh, that were recognized. After this parade, we came back to Ellensburg for a couple of hours. Then we loaded our families back up again if they wanted to go. God help us. Then drove to Moses Lake for an evening parade. This was always a very long day and well attended for the first five or six years. Then it really petered out and as the members were wanting, not wanting to attend. Then to make matters worse, they rerouted the parade route, passed the carnival, laid into the night, 
and the street lighting was so terrible and the visibility was so poor that we just had really a lot of problems with the horses and we decided this wasn't the best idea for us right now. But we do, uh, we're, as I understand, next year, we're gonna consider this again of going back to uh, that parade uh, as well as, um, I'm, I'm going blank on this. But anyway, we're gonna go back. Clay Ellen Pioneer Days, 4th of July Parade. This has always been a super fun parade as we would drive with our families to Clay Ellen, had their city park reserved in advance, then we'd tack up, ride the parade, load up our horses and head to the park for a potluck in the park. Always had our guest with us, the members of the King County Mounted Posse and their families and guests. Everybody brought their own chairs and parked and we parked and had picnic uh, tables available to us. Lots of good food as the women really went out of their way to do special uh, preparations for various foods. Besides the socializing with the guests, many of our younger riders and their families after eating would travel up the road to Roslyn for the Roslyn uh, Riders Play Day. Uh, and then after a few hours, then we'd return back to Ellensburg. Olympia Capital Lake Fair, uh, they just went last week uh, to the Lake Fair, several of our riders here. Here again was a complete duplicate of the Spokane Parade as we would meet at the rodeo grounds, load horses into semis and travel to Olympia. Not that on, note that on all semi trips we had a posse member riding shotgun with rod in case any unnecessary took place. Occasionally we had an incident, but after muzzling all the horses and trying to keep them together head to tail, Rod and the semi would arrive in Olympia down at the now end of the parade, but there was a big log dump there, and we would have to unload among the great big uh, logs. Uh, as we drove over with our families, we immediately checked into the governor's mansion, or the governor's house motel on the parade route. That was not the governor's mansion. <laughs> Sorry about this. I hope that it's information that you want to hear. Then, the, then we would take and ride the parade in reverse, which gave us double exposure, ride the parade route, untack, reload back in the semi, and then back to Ellensburg. When the semi arrived back home, we had posse members or family members that weren't going unload the horses into the posse barns and the arena pens at night. We went back to our motel, had a potluck, spent the night, and returned home the next morning. Family and friends already had picked up the horses and returned them to our homes. In the latter years, without the semi for transportation, we all grooved up and hauled to Olympia many times in caravan, ride the parade, and then go to the Flying M Ranch, which was owned by posse member Roger Musgrove, a member of the Thurston Posse. And our horses would be penned and stabled at his arena at night. Then Thurston Posse, uh, any of you girls in here that have been royalty, I know there's many, many of the brown girls. We would go to, uh, at the Flying M, they would have a huge, huge, huge clam and oyster feed prime rib, and they, we were their guest, uh, besides our horses being housed there for the night, and we went then back to the motel. Uh, this year, it had to change a little. They, uh, one of their posse members has bought a huge indoor arena over there, and he's refurbishing Pat Finnegan. And so they housed him, but they also entertained these people at their uh, last weekend. And I'm certain it was the same thing, Meg, or Morgan, I, you could say it, Morgan Roy. Yeah. But anyway, th we try to always maintain a super relationship with Thurston Posse and King County, and we reciprocate them when they arrive here to participate with us during the Ellensburg Rodeo and the Posse Night Shows. The Seattle Seafair, this one was fun. 
Again, a repeat of Spokane and Olympia parades. The semi-truck would take us to Seattle. We would unload at the Bar S packing plant down on Dearborn Avenue. We had already gotten to our motel in upper, at the upper end of the parade where our wives could then walk down and view the parade and then get back to the motel with no problem. Uh, not the problems they have today, but I mean, it was good. Then us members would drive down to Bar S, go through the security guard on duty, unload the horses, and ride the parade route in reverse, which gave us double exposure. And boy, what a trip that was. Literally, lots of exposure for this never been out of town country boy, I'll tell you. I can remember, and I can say this, I guess, because we have no youth kid, but I can remember one time <laughs> riding up, was it second or third street, George? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it was really entertaining. We rode by bars, and uh, uh, I remember one of our guys, I'm not gonna mention names, rode his horse into the front door, and the next thing, this out of town boy, Next thing I knew, here's all these girls with pasties on. And they came out, and they were entertainers in this lounge. And I, it was interesting. It was fun. But I will say, my dear friend and my sponsor, Low Driver, this is his necktie. <laughs> I, I had a hard time dealing with that at first, and I thought, God, I don't know if this is over my head, you know? But anyway, it all worked out. We had a lot of fun. We rode the parade. And, the, and then back to the semi, which was only a couple blocks away, then that is now uh, Bar S, I think, was basically a century length filled just to the back side of that now, where we uh, reloaded the horses. Then we went back to our motel where we had special rooms reserved for entertaining our family, friends, and guests, like the very rowdy and fun Seattle Pirates the Seattle Vigilantes, and any other groups that was willing to party with us in our special reserved room. Um, it was just a hell of a lot of fun. You can't believe what you missed. Next morning, then, we would get up and go out to one of the King County members' homes, usually one of the princesses. Yeah. <laughs> we got several of them said, yeah. We'd go out to one of their homes, and we would have a morning brunch before we would head back here. This was a very special event and so darn much fun we, that was had by everybody that was there. And there was times that several of our older members from Ellensburg that could no longer ride, uh, they would come over and also uh, sit down with us at the, at the brunch. Uh, I can remember uh, Lon, which is Scott's dad, uh, and Scott and Chuck's dad, a uh, very big member of the King County Posse. And that guy was such a wealth of knowledge. I, him and Mary McManamy Sr., I relied on them so much, and I wish I could have done more interviewing, but I spent more time on that spirit, uh, Blazers of the Trail. And then we lost Mary, I think, before, or Lon, yeah. And so I... I got beat out on finding out some of that information. Anyway, we would haul our own horses in the later years. Uh, we would haul our own horses and group up, go to a motel, stable the horses at Woodworth's Ranch and the Browns, Scott, Chuck, and Lon's place or the Bridal Trail stable across from Lon and Sally's house there uh, in their town. We would spend the night and then again in the morning we would travel to King County members' homes for a fantastic brunch before returning home. And we went through this with, I I think there was three of the brown girls that were princesses, four? Oh, there was four. And two of the Woodworths, and of course most of you know Megan Woodworth Meeks, the man general manager, yeah. Yeah, I rooted her out of her bed a couple of times to spend the night at the Woodworth's home. And we, we've remained very, very dear friends. But anyway, um, I'm going to leave with that on the, the parades. Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm going to go back. 
The posse from 1947 to present day attended so many parades throughout the Pacific Northwest. In 47, they would attend Roslyn the coal miners and then Seattle Seafair for the first time until about four years ago. Besides the above, many years were spent at the Bainbridge Strawberry Festival and Parade, the Mount Vernon Tulip Festival and Parade, Everett Salty Seas Days Festival and Parade, Puyallup Daffodil Parade, Moses Lake Parade, Yakima Sun Country, Wenatchee Apple Blossom Festival, Topnish Powwow, OMAC, OMAC and Parade, Spokane Lilac Festival, and the Olympia Lake Fair, and the Cleelum Shodio. I don't know what that is, but that was what Bob Neely had posted. And the Junior Chamber of Commerce Flight Breakfast and Picnic, and the Moxie City Hop Festival here in uh, just to name a few. After m many of the years of doing that, we made the decision that we were only gonna take place, w we only had enough time to do so many. So we kept our travels, our travels to the Wenatchee Apple Blossom Festival, Spokane Lilac, Military Day Parade, Easton, Moses Lake Spring Fling, Cleelum Pioneers, Olympia Lake Fair, Cleelum Roundup and the Cleelum uh, Rodeo and, and the Cleelum Rodeo and Parade. The last couple of years, uh, I'm going to throw this out to you because I, I'm certain you're going to hear rumors about this. But anyway, uh, the last couple of years, uh, we have been uh, considered uh, why we wouldn't come back to Seattle, and uh, that that created issues here that we, we needed to really work over. Um, after our fall from grace with Seattle, as to say, we have received many calls to come back as we were very big time missed at Seattle. And I realized Seattle is a big drawing card for the Ellensburg Rodeo. And so we, we would like to do our best. But the last time we went there, we were thrown in a parking lot. Uh, we had no places to, we had to hold our horses for five hours with their tack on because uh, there wasn't any place for us to be and the semi had to be out of there or we had to have our trailers out of there so we couldn't stay. And so anyway, we made up our mind that we wanted to be moved up in parade line because we were clear at the far back end and like, 150 out of a 300 horse, you know, and that really made a lot of uh, pressure on us and our poor animals. It got, well, it was just cruel. That's all there was to it. And we, we would like to go back, but there's several things, and I think I can speak for all of these guys in yellow here. If we go back, we want to negotiate. We want parade line up for our horses. We want a place to have our tailgate potluck and we want to get back, be able to get back to our rigs and safely, and we want to be policed uh, to get back to our rigs and make sure that our rigs are still there when we get back to them. So, um, and, and it's not that we won't do it, and I, I speak for these guys over here, that's their call, but uh, anyway, uh, hopefully someday you guys uh, or any of your family and friends from Seattle if you hear this, this is the reason why we didn't go back because we were pretty poorly treated uh, for what we gave up to be there. George, I may have to have you help me on this one, but I don't know. But anyway, cross we Pony Express cross country. To my knowledge, the posse has participated in three Pony Express relay races down the canyon and one from Ellensburg to Cleelum. Of course, most of you are very aware of the first one that we conducted. Our forefathers rode overland the uh, Weenass Umtanum area uh, up off of Dura Road, where the fire is right now, in 47, to take the invitation to the Yakima Airport to hand off to uh, the pilot a personal invitation to the President of the United States, Harry Truman for his attendance to at the 1947 Ellensburg Rodeo, which I understand that didn't happen. I mean, the ride did, but he didn't show up. 
but I think Lowe had a good time, as he, you can see in his picture. He was our captain in 47. It was Lowe Driver, my sponsor, much of a mentor. This is his necktie. And the photos depict Lowe rearing on the horse at the airport tarmac, handing the invitation off to the stewardess of the plane. Another one of the rides, I called and talked with George. So George, you can help me on this if I run astray. Mike Flone had been hired by the city of Ellensburg, or the chamber, uh, he knew me to the community, and he had uh, mule teams, and he was a member of the advertising and promotion of Kittitas County when they brought him aboard. They helped put together and took place in 1989 during the Washington State Centennial. Sid Morrison, state represent, gave a written letter of proclamation for the state and ask us as a posse if we would do a complete rerun of the 1947 letter to Harry Truman, President of the United States. The rodeo posse covered the Yakima Canyon via uh, the canyon route with, with each of us members that wanted to ride, riding in two mile stints, some of us having to take portion, a couple portions of that run. Thank God the weather turned so damn bad that they had to shut the canyon down. So that made it better for us to have to ride down that road. But we pulled it off. Some of the trailers after the riders had rode in the two mile stints went further on down the canyon to take another stint at riding. We were to get to the airport with a certificate and we were to meet at the Pomona Tavern for a gathering before proceeding into the Yakima area at the Yakima Airport and the King 5 TV. They were, those units were waiting. Well, Lowe and Rex got tired of waiting and loaded and headed. They were waiting at the Pomona Tavern. <laughs> yeah, and they got tired of waiting for us to arrive. And Scott and George Siddle, they were supposed to ride a portion of this. They got tired of waiting for their stint and they went into the bar and had a drink or two Needless to say, when their time came to ride, they were slightly in no condition to ride. So other of us picked up the remainder of that ride to the airport. Am I right so far, George? Good. Oh. <laughs> at the boondock. Okay. Well, when, then when we got to the airport, all went off without a hitch, but the news team also got tired of waiting for us to arrive, and they were long gone. <laughs> this was going to be a big thing. Our Pony Express leather bag that we carried this uh, cross-country uh, ride, um, to every rider, we transferred it to every rider so it would be a true Pony Express, uh, was made by George Mills of Mills Saddle and Tog. This was the year of the red, white, and blue. We purchased white shirts with red logo patches and red ties, a special blue Wrangler kind of pant, not blue jean, but pant. Blue belts with red, white, and blue buckles, snow white straw hats, and white saddle pads. Oh, and I almost forgot to send, spend several weeks braiding blue and white nylon halters and breast collars for the centennial year of 89. Another centennial moment, Bob Jackson, and I think it was Molly and Joe Morrow played a big part of this posse, decided we were going to travel to Olympia during the winter and deliver an invitation to Governor Booth Gardner and his wife, Jean to attend the Ellensburg Rodeo and Kittitas County Fair. Not wanting to haul the horses over for this trip in the winter, the Thurston Posse, our, our friends in Olympia, they generously provided us horses to ride to the Capitol Dome. We rode up to the governor's mansion and Jean Gardner opened the door to a horse standing at the mansion door, which drew a lot of applause. And this was uh, covered by King 5 TV on hand to cover the social event. Hopefully I'm right on this, George. And afterwards they had a small reception in honor of this goings on with Jean and Booth Gardner.
I just wanted to, in the summer of 76, the Walla Walla 59ers was sponsoring throughout Washington a Pony Express, which started in Mount Vernon, Washington, and was going cross country from state to state with assistance from all local riding clubs, groups, and volunteers. The Ellensburg Rodeo Posse rode the area from Ellensburg through to Yakima, where it was taken over them by the Yakima Sheriff's Posse and a women's drill team. This entire trip went cross country as far as Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Right, George? Yeah. So this was quite a, a feat for us to get involved with. That was their original plan, and we know that it got done. There was also a small Pony Express race uh, that came from Cleelum to Ellensburg. Uh, in talking with Craig Nesbeth in an interview and some recording, Craig, brother, Kurt, and dad, Willie, uh, members of the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse on January 3rd of 89, carried a proclamation from then Cleelum Mayor Gary Berndt to Ellensburg Mayor inviting the community to their centennial celebration. The team had requested from the DOT the rights to ride along the roadway, and it's not the free, but the back road, yeah. In Pony Express style, I might add that all three members of these were also part of the infamous Table Mountain Gang, as well as George, Joe, Bernie Schneider, Leroy Howery, John Shea, Roger Stark, George Shelton, Brian Fleming, and myself. I was going to go into more on the Table Mountain Gang, but... Huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to take too long. And I just wanted you to know, besides that, we sponsored the Junior Rodeo. The rodeo does to this day, and it has been forever. Uh, we're going, this is our 53rd this year. Yeah. So we sponsored the Junior Rodeo and the uh, Prize Ride and also two youth shows. And with that, I'm going to end it at there. Uh, any questions, get we, with me at this we point. Have a, yeah, we have an open mic here if anybody has some questions. I don't, uh, really quick. I, what, I knew you were going to talk about the history. By a show of hands, did anybody expect him to talk about virginity and topless women? So <laughs> I'm going to sidestep that, Oscar. But I'm going to sidestep that too, George. Yeah. I'm going to hand the mic over to jo George Ellison here. Yeah. Uh, is this working? Okay. Well, Oscar. Right. Okay, Oscar uh, talked about the posse, but posse members. I want to talk to you about posse members. Uh, I came in about two or three years before Oscar, but then I I dropped out. I'm still a member, but I haven't done it. Oscar came in '76, and he's still. Very, very active. Criminy, I don't know. I couldn't have bent over and picked that up. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, members that I, I, I remember that I'd like to talk about, just say a couple words. Claude Johnson, when I came in, there was a, he was a, worked at Shockey's, a bookkeeper. And uh, Claude was approached by the high school rodeo club they couldn't afford to put on a rodeo. And they asked Claude, could you help us out? And Claude, yeah, yeah, we'll finance it, yep. And we were able to do that for several years until the rodeo club decided they had to do jackpotting and that did not fit in with our bookkeeping. Uh, one day, uh, he, oh, he was our representative to the uh, to the uh, rodeo board, and uh, the rodeo board was giving him some guff about the races. We need to spice up the races. So Claude said, well, hey, 
why don't we have a race up to the water tower and back down? Oh, and the rodeo board, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> and so it was in, and then uh, Claude comes to the meeting a couple weeks later and says, I need some riders to run that race. <laughs> I've got a race, but I don't have riders. So people came in, and yeah, we had, we get, we had three people, Jay Sprouse, uh, uh, Eddie Kuhl, and myself. Yeah, we'll do that. And uh, it ended up actually uh, a after one of the performances, I don't know which one, but when they were doing the survey uh, of what was exciting, bull riding, number one, cliff race, number two. Didn't set well with the rodeo board, but it was <laughs> made us feel good. Uh, another one which Oscar talked about was Bob Jackson, Chamber of Commerce person, got us involved in the city work on the on the centennial or uh, like he was talking about going to o Olympia and doing all this stuff. But now we have this burger guy who has assumed the leadership, the roles. He's the one that going out and he's the one that is initiating things for you people to do, which the posse is a spirited, community-oriented organization. And if, when you're working at, or go out in public, and if somebody has an idea, you know, wouldn't it be cool if Kittitas County did this, or wouldn't it be cool if Ellensburg did this? Say, yeah, I'll see what we can do, because we've always been able to do it. And, and that's what we need to keep going. Now, Oscar also talked about wives. <laughs> and Oscar, oh, Oscar, we would like to present, it. could you hold it? Because I can't, I know, hold, hold this. You don't get that yet. Okay. Um, Molly Morrow, a wife of a posse member, has put this together to commemorate all the things you have done for our organization. Cool, isn't it? Wait till you see the rest. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, this is Oscar at Piano Molly Morrow took it. Molly Morrow just wants you to say. Oh, wow. Um, Kathy Trail. Yeah. You that epitomize awesome. exactly what you epitomize what we feel a posse member should be. Isn't that cool? And evidently your hat's been falling off. She figured you needed this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that that's just taped off. And Oscar, I, I do wanna say it it's it's been wonderful knowing you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions before I introduce our King County Posse members. Does anybody have uh, any questions for, for Oscar or maybe even George or current Posse members have any stories that could go along with antics of uh, Posse members from the past? Never these gentlemen and ladies right here. Uh, I wanted to welcome our first lady in the Ellensburg Rodeo Posse. This is Miss Morgan Farrell. And yeah, yeah. So I, I did want to recognize that. I did not vote in favor of her. I will tell you that. And I told Morgan this. I have always stood firm on this, that it was a men's group. And I felt that was our forefathers. And she's a, a super gal. She is a super gal, and I'm certain I'm going to have to change my way of going or melt to the back. But anyway, I want to welcome Morgan aboard. Yeah. Thank you, Oscar.
Oscar didn't mention the posse breakfast, which was an integral part of the whole rodeo weekend. And before those started, my husband was new on the board, and my father, being a posse member, decided that we should have a Sunday morning rodeo breakfast. So we invited Ellensburg Posse and King County Posse and maybe the Ellensburg board and a bunch of our friends. We figured on 100 people. Well, that 100 people, we fed close to 400 that morning in our backyard. Even Stuart Anderson showed up with his truck or his bus with 30-some people on it. And to get tickets to go to his party on Sunday night were very limited. And we also had the KOMO TV crew camping in our backyard. So as he showed up with all his entourage, I said, well, this TV crew needs to come to your party tonight. And a lot of my family kids are camping here. Bring them all, bring them all. What was, we all got to, everybody went to Springwood that time. But Albertsons, Dick Mundy, my neighbor Janet Riggs at the time, my mother, um, Lee Tracy, and Jill McDowell cooked all morning. Albertsons was cooking hams. Dick Mundy was running to get orange juice, and we were able to get vodka somehow from the liquor store, so we had enough of that. But the next year, the posse started having their breakfasts that continued, and the posses and all of their families could come, and it was, it was a great tradition while it lasted. Okay, then 50 years ago, we had the first one. Thanks, Mary. Well, I'm not going to try to top what Oscar was mentioning or what George and, and Mary were saying as well. So this gives me an opportunity to introduce our two King County Posse members. We have Bill Woodworth, Scott Brown, if you both can join, a, join me here. I think I got the podium here in between the both of you. So B Bill is wearing his 2002 traditional black and white King County Posse uniform that has been worn by the King County Posse since 2002 to the present. Bill has been the captain of the Posse since 2006. That's a good legacy of dedication. And Bill's two daughters, as Oscar mentioned, uh, they both served on the Ellensburg Rodeo Royal Court as the King County Princesses. Megan Meeks, who is the general manager of the uh, Ellensburg Rodeo. She's the one who really runs the show there, and any of the board members would agree with me. Uh, she was princess in 2001, uh, and her sister Melissa served in 2004 as well. And uh, Scott is also wearing the King County Posse uniform. He has served since 1983, I believe it is. Uh, Scott has a hay and cattle operation here in the valley, and uh, called Brown Brothers Farm, right out there, I believe, Grinrod Road, give or take. Yep. Uh, and I'm right next to Oscar's place. Uh, for the last 30 years, he lives between Kirkland and the Kittitas Valley here. He's an active member of the King County Posse as well. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. Testing, testing. Yep. Um, you want to start? You're older. <laughs> is this on? I was afraid of that. Um, well, actually, I'm just up here for eye candy. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> Bill will, will probably uh, start this off and give you some history of the posse. What I'll do is fill you in on some of the anecdotes and uh, some of my history, which fortunately is uh, extensive within the posse. So, okay, Bill? okay. Uh, 1941 was the year for the King County Sheriff Posse to begin. Um, it was formed by Dan Beacons of Beacons Moving and Storage. Some of you folks might remember that. And he was instrumental in getting this posse established. There were a number of uh, friends of his from Seattle all the way down to Tacoma who were horsemen back in those days. And he said, let's get together. So um, 
they met at a place in uh, North Seattle. And they called it, it was interesting, they called it the halfway house because it was halfway between Seattle and Tacoma. <laughs> but they had 11 members show up that night. And they all decided that this was the right thing to do. So they, they went ahead and started with the King County Sheriff Posse. And um, it wasn't very long after that that the, the actual King County Sheriff Force recognized that they had a posse in town. And they went over and said, how would you guys like to be actually deputized sheriffs? And they said, well, we'll think about it. <laughs> they didn't think very long because it was in December of 1941, they actually commissioned all of these 11 members. And you'll notice up here on this, this uniform here is one of the original 1941 uniforms for the King County Sheriff Posse. And Scott brought tonight one of the actual badges that didn't get turned in. Um, and I, <laughs> I stuck it on the, <laughs> stuck it on the uniform. But that uniform there was also manufactured at K Turks in Van Nuys, California. They basically were the tailors for all uni or for all law enforcement officers. And so in that uniform there, we put that on display during our um, uh, fashion show back in April, April 30th. And I had, um, you can see this uniform was built for a very slender gentleman. Um, we tried that on three of our male posse members and we could get it on but couldn't button or zip it up. <laughs> so we had to give it to one of our lady members who she was able to get it on. Anyway. It's it's also made of wool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black wool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you think these shirts are warm. That was like, that's why they were so s skinny. <laughs> but anyway, um, so anyway, they, so they actually commissioned these 11 members as King County Sheriff, and um, at then they also created a drill team in the 1941, and the drill master was a guy by the name of Harry Jennings, who was the drill master for the first six years. And so these people, I believe they were, they, Auburn, I believe they always went out to Auburn to one of the gentlemen's ranches and did all their practices there. Um, so the big thing for this posse was when it was first started, it was not an all Palomino posse. I, I forget the year, but the they got a, a contract or a bid from the Western Washington State Fair held in Puyallup. And they said, we would love to give you a bid, sign a contract to perform at our fair. I believe it was 46, something like that, 47. It's up here. It's on one of these posts of here. But in 47, so they said, well, but one of the conditions of the contract is you have to be an all Palomino posse. So Burke Croshaw, Pat Murphy, a few of those gentlemen said, there's no good Palominos in Washington. Let's go to Billings, Montana. <laughs> so they went on to Billings, Montana, bought enough Palominos for those members who did not have a Palomino. They came back with those horses, sold them to the member, and they were able to get those horses conditioned up and ready for uh, a posse drill. So they were able to pull it off. And over here on the black and white photo album, there's a little paper article that talks about their involvement at the 47 Western Washington State Fair. Back in those days, from 41 when they were established, 47, the King County Sheriff Posse had quite a reputation. They pulled in for the first day to watch them drill 100,000 people. I w I th when I read that article, I thought, well, that's no big deal. It's a seven-day parade. I have a seven-day uh, fair. They can get that. That was one day. There's a picture of the stands. They're full. The, the sheriff's posse used to perform a lot of drills at different events. They were, they were big at the 1962 World's Fair. And you want to tell that story about Bert? in his water ski? Um, well, one of our members, Bert Croshaw, um, had a horse that was relatively fast and stout. And uh, for the water show that they had, he pulled a water skier around the uh, arena where you know the, the water was on the inside and the horse 
could run on the outside. It was quite a spectacular yeah. thing. And we, we, have, we have photos of that, which we'll get to the uh, Hall of Fame here. But uh, the other thing that I was going through all these, these books that have been handed down from the Brown family to me and to my wife, Chris, who's sitting back here in the audience, mother of our two daughters. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of history in there. And these, there's two books in particular that were created by actual members of the King, Sh King County Sheriff Posse, a Clifford Smith, and he, he put together his, his own basic biography of his time with the Posse, and the other one was Pat Murphy. And uh, these are in really bad, they're, they're wooden, they're actually wooden c covers, and the paper is so thin, we have to figure a way to photocopy or something to, sp to preserve it. But a lot of paper articles and so forth, and the Burt Croshaw thing. The other thing that stood out was, uh, if every people are familiar with the Bon Marche, a, a big department store in downtown Seattle, uh, one of the King County Sheriff Posse members was a employee of the Bon Marche. He was able to get the Bon Marche to clear the second floor of the Bon Marche and build it as a barn and a stable for all the King County Sheriff horses and tack. They got those horses up in the elevators. <laughs> and we have pictures of them with these horses in these made up stalls with all these beautiful silver saddles. And then they showed the, the amount of people that came down to just to see this, this event. Unbelievable what those people would do. But remember, these King County Sheriff Posse members were high rollers. Beacons moving in storage, oil companies, uh, grocery store outlets, um, and it just goes on and on. So when Oscar talked about the things that these POS members did on the road to go to a parade, it wasn't just to go to the parade. They would go there, rent a hotel, rent a ballroom, party hardy, do the parade, do the rodeo, and go home. And that was, that was, that was the way these people rolled back then. So um, very interesting. So, But the other thing I want to bring to your attention is that in the since 1941 to the present, there have been three different names of this posse. From 1941 to 1971, it was, it was the King County Sheriff Posse. And that badge says King County Sheriff Posse on it. Then in 1972, it was, the name was changed to King County Mounted Police. And that, it, that name stayed with them until 2001. And then when I joined the posse in 2002, I remember it was my first practice. We would always go over to the Kirkland Bridal Trails Park, and we, it was just, it w everybody knew in, in that area that that was, the, that was the posse's arena for the night. And we would practice our drill. 16 guys on horseback, carrying four by six flags, trying not to run into each other. And I remember I was new to this, so I, everything was just, you know, but we had a gentleman sh showed up there at that night, and he looked very official in a King County Sheriff's uniform. And he, he said, gentlemen, when you're all done with your practice uh, and untack your horses, come back and sit in the stands. I want to talk with you. And, and we sort of knew what was going on because we had seen that the King County had budget cuts coming, and, you know, they, so we were, we're going to get axed. So he sat us down up there. I remember Lon Brown was in there, Chuck Scott. The whole brown tree was in the, in the stands with us. And he asked us, he said, uh, well, you guys heard the bad news. He says, we can no longer support you financially. They used to pay our insurances, buy our flags, and you know th those things. And um, all those nice buckles and badges that you have, we'll, I'll have to collect them. And so then he sort of paused, and he said, but I'll be back here next Monday to pick them up. So he says, but if you lost them by then, I can understand. <laughs> so that's why <laughs> there's one over there. And there's a few, a few of our other members have, have theirs too, but you know, but he basically said their keepsake, don't impersonate law enforcement with them. They, they have all, they all have numbers and they've all yeah. been decommissioned. So. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was sort of a cool thing. So then in, so, so after that, we, our name changed from King County Mount of Police just to King County Posse. But we, s we carry on the same tradition, have the same fun, and, you know, those types of things. Um, you talked about Bert. Um, 
Uh, I will say the you know welcome to Morgan over there. We uh, are, we've always embraced women in our posse because we wanted to keep it alive. <laughs> we want to keep our membership. So our first uh, female member was one of, and is still a member today, but uh, Melanie Rosendahl, she has 30, 32 years with the posse. And she was our first female uh, King County mounted posse member in 1992. Uh, we were we were inducted into the Ellensburg Rodeo Hall of Fame in 2005, and we have been doing the grand entry. I guess that's basically our our most famous thing we do, and we're very very proud to do so. Um, to present the colors at the grand entry, and we've been doing that since 1945. <laughs> this, thank you. This. 2024 rodeo will be 80 years for us so it's, it's and that I didn't really start thinking about that until I believe it was last year's rodeo and you know we it's sort of a it's 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 still a I've been doing this now for 22 years and it still gets you a little bit upset excited you know you, sh for you shed a few tears carrying that four by six flag and you got 8,000 people that are standing on their feet and we got Mary over there and we got our daughter and we go by them and everybody's, you know, cheering and laughing, and, you know, and praising us on. And um, that this will be 80 years. And um, when, when we hear Justin McKee up in the box, we have this we have this little cue on when to go. And first of all, we have to, um, when the rodeo starts, we have to count how many of the Yakima Nation are going up the hill. Very, very, very important because we can't go in the arena until that same number comes out, and it never comes out the same. <laughs> so, because we can't go in there with a loose horse. So we're all, we, we typically, like last year, it was just yeah. stupid numbers, but typically it's 13 to 15 that go up the hill and come down. So we watch, okay, when 15 come down, and I see our, our, our uh, grand entry rodeo manager back there, Mr. Bill Lau, we uh we we basically wait for Justin McKee to say okay, our friends from the West, the King County Posse, and it was last year that Justin McKee for some reason he says, and this will be their 79th appearance, and I th that's right I said w that many, so I went home and I did my math and he's right this will be 80 this year, so it, that's quite a, that's quite a feat for us to do, to to keep it alive. So um. So we we're we're a small posse, posse of 11. Uh, but we we only need seven people to go out there and carry a flag, so we're we're proud to continue to represent uh, one of the the best rodeos in the United States of America, the Ellensburg Rodeo. <laughs> Got anything to add? Some funny stories like Oscar did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any strippers or uh, virginity to enter. Um, I'll give you a little little background. My dad joined the posse in 1969, and uh, we're a very close family. I've got one brother, Chuck. Um, we always have done a lot of stuff together. We worked together for 40 years. Uh, my dad, at one point, said the posse needs some writers, and so all of a sudden, Chuck and I were conscripted. Well, the long and short of it is, uh, over the years, I uh, got my oldest daughter, Sarah, to join. Uh, I had my brother-in-law, Greg, mm -hmm. had my son-in-law, John, and, uh, and his brother-in-law. So we, we really made it a family affair for a <laughs> while. Um, we've always enjoyed the relationship that we've had with uh, the Ellensburg Posse, as well as the uh, rodeo board, and uh, and the people in Ellensburg, and uh, about 25 years ago, I bought a place here, uh, and still have that, and, and sp split my time between Kirkland and and uh, Ellensburg. Um, we, uh, our family has been particularly blessed because. All four of my daughters have been princesses on the royal court, which is uh, a real honor, and uh, it's it's one of those things that we're very proud, uh, 
not only of their representation, but the fact that we were blessed to be able to do something like that. Um, funny little stories. Our posse, as you can tell, there's a white shirt back here. At one time, everybody figured we should be creative. We had white shirts and black shirts. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got white shirts and black shirts, you've got to have black hats and white hats. And invariably, when we'd show up to a function, somebody would be wearing the wrong color shirt or the wrong color hat. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times, we'd scramble, and so you'd have somebody who had their white shirt. It was supposed to be black. And so we'd have have it mixed all throughout. It was uh, we did a lot of stuff like that. But we also, uh, as Oscar uh, alluded to, we had a lot of family outings, a lot of family picnics and gatherings. Uh, not only with our own posse, but with uh, neighboring posses, the Ellensburg posse, at uh, at the end of parades or uh, or drills and. Uh, been a, a really great experience. Speaking to the white shirt, uh, we did bring that white shirt back into our uniform for the 100th rodeo. And I, and I remember what Chuck or what Scott was saying. Um, yes, there were some guys that didn't read the memo. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll never forget this one year. Uh, I was living on the west side back then, such as the Browns were too, and everybody comes over to rodeo and we're getting ready to go in for Friday night and we noticed that uh, Chuck Brown forgot his breast collar. He had the nerve to ask if we all wanted to remove our breast collars. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, no, <laughs> you're gonna, and he, and, and Chuck let us in. So he was gonna be the knucklehead that's without his breast collar. But the white shirt, yeah, that, that was an issue. Um, and we brought it back for the 100th rodeo. And uh, I knew, we didn't, we didn't change out the hats though. <laughs> I remember um, when we talked about this, uh, just going to this black and white shirt when your father was still with us, he didn't like you boys. He liked his silver belly, right. and he did not like a black hat. So he was mad that his boys were going to put him in a black hat and a black and white shirt. But black hat did minimize the mess up of our uniform. If you had your white shirt, you just had a black hat. So we did bring the white shirt back last year. It's just, and we will we'll wear it this year for the Saturday parade and the Saturday rodeo. And of course, black and white Friday, black and white Sunday, and pink on Sunday. So, and so that was pretty much the the King County Posse that w which exists today. And if any of you you know, guys want to switch over, you know, we'll, we'll accept. Any that. any questions yeah. out here? Yeah. Oh, we got Mike. We got Mike. Yeah. Oh. Well. One of the requirements for our posse is to have a silver saddle, and uh, mm -hmm. not just a tin saddle, but uh, real silver. Um, and it's amazing the number of saddles that there are out there that uh, that have all different kinds of uh, silver work on them, and uh, and there's some ab absolutely beautiful. Saddles. Some are some are almost gaudy because they've got so much uh, sterling silver on them. My dad's was that way, yeah. and uh, you know he had to have help lifting it onto the horse. But uh, on his horn there was a big gold piece, and and then silver all over it. it nice saddle, but a uh, little impractical. Great for parades, you know. A little tough when we would do a drill and we'd have to uh, do it in our silver saddles, but uh, there. Uh, fortunately, there's still enough silver saddles out there, Mary, that we can still find them and, and yeah. keep the posse going. Yeah, for speaking on the silver saddles, this one right out here by uh, on the horse, that's a Ted Flowers saddle. Now Ted Flowers was one of the one of those top. I'd say top five silver saddle makers back in the 40s and 50s, and um, I've got I've got three of those saddles at home. I collect the Ted Flowers, and actually that was my saddle. That was my wife's saddle. I sold to a one a gentleman in the posse who has on display here, which I'm hoping to buy back. But um, there's Ted Flowers, 
There's um, Ed Bolin. Um, uh, Boyce, what? Boyt, 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 which was the Roy Rogers saddle maker. Uh, Hop, uh, Hassan. Yeah, Hessen Hopkins. There's, and so these saddles, you can you can still see them around. Um, the market is pretty good on right now. If they're in good condition, you can buy them anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars. But remember, these this these are this is this is a piece of history here. Um, like Scott said, you can still buy these made saddles today, but they're nothing like what we have here. That saddle is all German silver. Um, the and more expensive saddles are going to be sterling silver. But um, I, I, and it's probably one of the most comfortable saddles I've ridden in. It, they're beautiful saddles. Take a little bit of polishing, but I would say it comes in about 55, 60 pounds. Now, when I put mine on my horse, I have to take my tapaderos off because they're all silver, and just it reduces the weight. The other thing about those saddles is you cannot treat them like a work saddle. You can't throw the fenders up. The metal will go popping off. So you have to be very, very careful as how you take care of them. So typically... The week before rodeo, I'll spend probably two or three days polishing saddles. I have the one I ride, then I loan one out to Julia Wickerath, who is a, one of our members, and then the other one is, is, is on basically a spare, it's like a spare tire. In case we have a problem, it's ready to go. So, but the, and all three of my saddles will be handed down to Megan's children, so they'll have them to carry on. So yeah, saddles are important. Yes. Mother's Mag Aluminum Polish is the best polish for any silver you got. Just pick it up at your local auto hardware store. <laughs> and the other, thing, the other thing I'll mention too is one of my winter projects is to go through all of the history that's been provided to me from the Brown family, and I have cataloged every person who has worn a King County Sheriff, King County Mounted Posse, or King County Posse shirt. And on this list here, I have 149 people, men and women, who have been writing for the King County Posse. So it's quite a history. <laughs> and that's all we got. What are the questions? Do we, Oscar, go ahead. It could have been. Um, I know that in California, we are we have a website, and we my wife administers that. And uh, there is another posse in California, and they're called the Kings K A N G S County Posse. We get a lot of their people sending stuff to us, and they're also a Palomino Silver Saddle. And there's also there and there's one other posse in California that is a sp so there's three of us out there. And, and if you look closely, they say that there's actually four because the military, uh, I believe it was, I'm not sure if it was the Marine Corps or the Army, but they were riding BLM Palomino Mustangs w with regular work saddles and not silver saddles. So there were at one time there were four so-called posses on Palomino horses. Yeah. So. It's got the color guard, yeah, right. Yep, yep, yeah. So um, go out and get your rodeo tickets if you haven't already got them. Yeah. I understand that Saturday and Sunday are pretty lean, but Friday and Monday they got some tickets still. Yeah. What other questions or comments or stories can we, can we share or ask of Bill and Scott? Oh. Yes. Oh. Chuck, yeah. yeah, when we when we uh, when we're ready to enter into the arena, and we and we we do like coming through those those uh, shoots there, Bill. We do like it, and uh, so we so when Chuck Brown was our leader, and he had a, a horse named Nick, beautiful horse, a half Arab, so it, it just looked phenomenal going in the arena. But like I said, you really sort of get amped up when it's your time to go, because then your horses get amped up too, and you've got to be in line. And 
And we also have to be careful because um, we have that, all that iron that we have to cr travel through. And we have to, and we always say, take, when you got your flag in your hand, pinky down to the horse's butt, and you won't hang your flag in the, in the iron. And so um, Chuck would always say, um, screw, on, screw your on your hat and dip your, and, and dip your flag. And so, and that, w that was, so when he said that, we knew we're, we're going, you know, and so you, d you don't want to be late for the party. So you head off. And so uh, now I think uh, we have another gentleman now that's leading in, Scott Mason, and I pretty much gave him what he needed to say. I said, screw on your hats and let's give him something to talk about. <laughs> so that we, we head on in. But, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's uh, quite a, an honor. Uh, and, you know, you do get sort of teary-eyed. Uh, when you head in there and you and you go into that big arena and you see all those people and they enjoy the grand entry just as much as anybody else does and then you know uh, it'll be interesting because this year we go back to normal i i think where we're going to do the we're going to do the we we're not going to walk we're going to have people run around us which is always fun to we think of ourselves as human targets <laughs> and uh <laughs> and we've had we've had a couple accidents one year Number position number three is where the weave starts, and one year Mike Fraley was at that position. And he got T-boned twice, two different uh, Saturday Sunday, snapped his flag one day, and I I looked over and I didn't understand why he was doing the Michael Jackson on his knees because his horse was walking backwards and he was trying to keep his horse. And I looked over and I thought, and you know that's that's where um, those pickup guys are fantastic. They, they they they'll come in and they they help out, you know, to, and so. Mike said, I never, ever want that position again. So I, I'm at position three now, which is, because that's, whoever leads, if they, if they set the right course, all the other horses follow. If they cut corners, man, you're, you're getting hit and slapped and everything else. But again, great opportunity. Uh, we're only out there for 20, 25 minutes, a lot of fun. And it's, we come out and we're just all super high, so. Yeah, yeah. And it was something that when you even pick on them in front of thousands of people, yeah. I mean, that was, it was just really part yeah. of the thing. Yeah, you can't, you, you can't explain it within the music playing and the Star Spangled Banner and then um, uh, Justin up there giving it just one heck of a good speech, you know. He just, he just really makes it Western. Oh, yeah. 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 Anyway, is that all the questions you had, dear? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, silver it saddles on golden horses. Any other questions for our King County friends? Thank you, Bill. You know, I'll echo that sentiment as well. So this will be year number 25 for me. And uh, with with you and your posse presenting the colors, presenting Old Glory, and Justin, yeah. Justin could talk about paint drying and will still get me emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty amazing, pretty Im pretty impressive. And I love bring in guests from out of town and I say you got to be early to the rodeo because yeah. it starts with the the Yakima Nation yeah. and our posse our King County posse members yeah. here so yeah. gentlemen I appreciate you, your Bill. words I'm sure the stories will continue after we officially break here thank you but thank you to Bill and and Scott and and Oscar as well and I just want to remind everybody that our, our quarterly series, our Night at the Museum, as, as we're calling it, continues in, in late October where uh, you were talking about the pickup men. The pickup men and judges uh, will be uh, on the stage talking about their role in rodeo, their role in the history of rodeo as well. I'm sure there's some stories we could laugh about. I'm sure pickup men got some stories that we can cringe about as well. Um, but again, I want to remind you that that's... Uh, that is in late October. In October as well, we're going to have our our whiskey tasting night, and we're adding. Uh, proud to we're happy to say 
So we're adding uh, gin and vodka to that as well. It's going to be a heck of a party. Maybe it's going to be the kind of party that uh, these gentlemen were talking about earlier tonight. Um, but again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, make sure to continue to mingle. The bar is still open, it looks like. and, and uh, But uh, we will see everybody back here at any time. But of course, uh, for our next uh, speaker series uh, in late October. So thank you very much, everybody. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds and we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather.